All right, so welcome everyone to this session entitled Designing Engaging Micro Lectures. I am really excited to be with you all today to share some resources that I use with faculty at my university to help them level up their micro lectures. Um, if you haven't yet done so, I'd love to have you introduce yourself in the chat by sharing your name, your role, and your institution, just so that we have a sense of who's in the room. And I also wanted to let you know that I asked Tom beforehand if it's okay if we go until the end of the hour. So we will be going until three o'clock p.m. Eastern time, 12 o'clock p.m. Pacific. <laughs> um, so just know that if you have to hop out for any reason, it's completely fine. The workshop is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it back later. All right, so greetings. My name is Tolu Noah, and I've been working in the field of education for about 19 years now in different contexts. My journey actually began as a K-12 teacher, so I taught fifth and sixth grade language arts and social studies here in Los Angeles for nine years. And then I transitioned into higher education and became an associate professor in the undergraduate teacher education program at Azusa Pacific University, where I taught for seven years. After that, I pivoted into the corporate ed tech world and worked as a senior professional learning specialist at Apple, helping educators explore how they could leverage technology for teaching and learning. And I'm now back in academia working as the Instructional Learning Spaces Coordinator at Cal State Long Beach here in Southern California, where I facilitate workshops and consultations about teaching and technology. And a fun fact, in my free time, I'm actually writing a book right now about designing meaningful professional learning experiences. So that has been a ton of fun as well. Um, if you'd like to connect either during or after the session, you can find me on Twitter or on Blue Sky at Dr. Toa Unoa, and I invite you to share any takeaways you have there. So during this webinar, I'm going to be sharing a workshop that I designed to help faculty once again level up their use of micro lectures. So we're going to dive in now, and I'm going to facilitate this workshop just as I would with faculty at my university. All right, so here's our agenda for today. We're going to begin by discussing what micro lectures are, the benefits of micro lectures, tools that you can use for creating them. I'm also going to share a helpful planning template for designing micro lectures. And then during the latter half of our session, we'll explore some recording tips, accessibility and sharing considerations. We'll also do a little action plan and reflection exercise, and then we'll wrap up with some closing information and feedback. And our three outcomes for today are that you'll be able to describe the characteristics and benefits of micro lectures, identify different tools that can be used to create micro lectures, and then describe important factors to consider when recording and sharing micro lectures. So let's dive in and we'll start off with this first question of what exactly are micro lectures? And I think the best way to explain what micro lectures are is to actually talk about what they are not. So micro lectures are not like traditional instructional videos. And I wanted to start just by highlighting, highlighting some of the common issues that arise with traditional instructional videos. I do wanna preface this by saying these are general statements. It doesn't apply to every instructional video out there, but in general, Traditional instructional videos, first of all, tend to be long. So a professor might record their entire, you know, 60 minute lecture and then upload that to the LMS for students to watch. Along with that, traditional instructional videos tend to be content heavy. So in the course of that video, the professor might address a variety of content and skills that students need to learn. Along with that, some instructional videos can be passive where students are mostly just sitting and watching and they're not really doing anything with that information. And then in some cases, traditional instructional videos can also feel a little bit distant where there's not a clear connection between the instructor and the students. So my first question for you all is how might these factors create inadvertent challenges or barriers for learners? So please feel free to share any thoughts you have about that question in the chat. Okay, and there's a flood of responses coming in right now. So I'm seeing, let me scroll up. Tracy says cognitive overload. Yes, and we're gonna talk about that more in a moment. Shava says they don't feel connected to the instructor. Naj says bored. John says attention span. Becky says hard to hold student interest for a long time. And I'm seeing that same theme of students not maintaining interest. Sue mentions it's not engaging. Lynn agrees with that. Kate mentions lack of application. I'm scrolling down to see if I'm missing any major themes here. Overload. Celine says if they need translation, it's not practical. Great point. So thinking about our multilingual students. 
Aaron says, it's hard to learn something if the instruction is passive and content heavy. Great point, Aaron. Steven says, not relevant. Okay, so many great points in the chat and 100% agree with everything that's been shared there. So definitely, these factors can definitely create some challenges for the variety of learners in our classrooms. And so this is where micro, micro lectures can be a really helpful alternative. So Zhang defines micro lectures as a short video, usually produced by the instructor, that explains a single key concept or a specific skill. So unlike traditional instructional videos that are content heavy and address a large variety of things, micro lectures are really focused and once again, really zoom in on one particular concept or one particular skill. And according to Zhang, micro lectures have three important characteristics. So first of all, they're brief and micro lectures are typically shorter than 10 minutes, although a lot of professors aim more for five to six minutes because research shows that the longer the video is, the less likely students are to remain engaged in watching it. Another important characteristic of micro lectures is that they are personal. That is that they convey a sense of instructor presence or connection with students. And third, micro lectures are interactive. So this means that they actually include active learning opportunities where students have the chance to process what they're learning in really engaging ways. So Zhang mentions that this can be in the form of pause points where you actually tell students to pause the video and complete a reflection or some other sort of activity to once again process what they're watching as they're watching the video. So one thing you might be thinking right now is, okay, Tolu, I see what you're saying. I like this vision, but my students really do need to know everything that I would typically cover in a 60 minute lecture. What you can do in that case is maybe think more about chunking. So how can you break up that really long lecture maybe into four 15 minute videos or six 10 minute videos? Something that once again is going to be much more manageable for your students. And then along with that, we wanna think about video design principles when we are creating our micro lectures as well. So Meyer, who's like the godfather of instructional videos has identified about 14 different characteristics of effective instructional videos. We're not gonna talk about 14 today, but I did wanna highlight four that Cynthia Brain from Vanderbilt also highlights as important when working, when creating instructional videos for students. So the first important video design principle is signaling. So this is all about pointing out key details in your video. And you can do this in a variety of ways. It can just be through the emphasis that you place vocally on certain words and terminology. It can also be through visual cues. So things like arrows and highlighting and things like that that draw students' attention to the really important information that they need to learn. A second important design principle is, is segmenting. So this is all about chunking the content of the video into manageable pieces. And you can once again do this by actually breaking it up into smaller segments so that it's easier for students to follow along and see how all of the concepts are related to each other. A third important principle, and this is often the trickiest one to accomplish, is weeding. So this is where we actually want to omit any unnecessary information from our videos. And this is not only unnecessary information that we're, we're providing orally, but also things like really busy slides <laughs> that once again can be distracting to learners or having background music, which can also interfere with their learning. And then the last principle we'll talk about, talk about for now is matching modality. So this is all about providing information in multiple formats, which is another great UDL um, principle as well. So if we're conveying information on the slides, we also wanna you know, reiterate that information auditorily and that way students can have multiple ways of being able to process the information. So let's pause for another chat. And my question for you all is which of these four video design principles would you like to be more intentional about when creating videos in the future? So please feel free to share whichever one's kind of resonating with you the most in the chat. All right, Bonnie says signaling. A lot of people mentioned signaling. <laughs> I'm also seeing weeding looks like it's also in first or second place as well. Couple of votes for segmenting and then matching modality. So all four have come up in the chat. And I share this because, you know, we all have our areas of strength and we all have areas that we're working on. And even though I talk with faculty about designing um, effective instructional videos, I still have things I'm working on myself too. And that weeding one can be a little bit tricky. So thank you all for sharing that in the chat as well. 
And with that, I want to transition to actually sharing an example of a micro lecture that I created. Um, this is based on one of the courses that I used to teach, which was Intro to Teaching as a Profession. And in that course, I was working with undergraduate students who were preparing to become classroom teachers. And one of the main outcomes for the course was students being able to develop measurable student learning outcomes for their lesson plans so that when they went into the classrooms, once again, they were able to assess student learning in really efficient ways. So I'm actually going to put on my faculty developer hat for a second. Uh, because I do want to acknowledge that the video you're about to see does have a more traditional view of Bloom's taxonomy and learning objectives. And I know that within the educational development and faculty development world, there are lots of different perspectives on that. So please don't come for me if this doesn't <laughs> align with your beliefs. Once again, I, it was what I um, had to make sure that my students were equipped to know. So when you're watching this video, I'm going to ask you to really think more about those video design principles, not so much the content of the video. And with that, I will take off my faculty developer hat and we'll turn to our regularly scheduled programming. All right, so as you watch this video, I'd like you to think about these micro lecture characteristics. So what do you see in terms of it being brief, personal and interactive? And then what do you also notice in terms of the video design principles? So signaling, segmenting, weeding and matching modality. And thank you, Bonnie, I'm glad I'm safe here. <laughs> All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and play this video. Once again, keep an eye out for what you're noticing in terms of these characteristics. And then after that, we're going to debrief what you saw as a whole group. Hello, students. Dr. Noah here. In this micro lecture, we're going to be discussing the essential question, what are the characteristics of effective learning objectives? In terms of our agenda for today, we're going to begin with retrieval practice. We'll then define objectives, discuss the criteria for effective objectives. We'll do an activity called effective or not. We'll talk about how what we're, what we're discussing today connects to what's coming up, and then we'll wrap up with an exit ticket. And our three outcomes for today are that you'll be able to define objectives, describe the characteristics of effective objectives, and then distinguish between effective and ineffective objectives. So we're going to begin with a retrieval practice activity just to review what we've talked about previously. So what I'd like you to do is either grab a sheet of paper or open up an app on your device and you're going to write down everything you can remember about backwards design. Now remember with retrieval practice, you're not looking at your notes or anything, you're just recalling from memory. So take a moment to pause this video, record everything you can remember about backwards design, and when you're ready, resume this video. Welcome back. So what we're going to do next is we're going to review backwards design. And as we do so, I encourage you to compare what you wrote during the retrieval practice to what we're reviewing now. So as a reminder, backwards design is all about planning with the end in mind. And there are three key stages. The first stage is developing the student learning goals. In other words, what should students know or be able to do by the end of the unit? The second stage is all about developing the assessment. In other words, what will you use to measure if students have actually accomplished the learning goals? And then the third stage is developing your instructional strategies. In other words, the specific activities and methods that you'll use to help students be successful with the assessment. So today's micro lecture is really gonna focus on this first stage of developing student learning goals. We'll begin by defining the term objective. So objectives state what students should know or be able to do by the end of a particular lesson. In other words, it's a lesson goal. And it's really important that our lessons are goal-driven rather than activity-driven. Now there are several criteria to keep in mind when it comes to developing your objectives, and we're just gonna focus on two criteria for today. The first criteria is that your objectives should be student achievement based. What this means is that they should focus on what students should know or be able to do by the end of the lesson. And a really helpful way to ensure that your objectives are student achievement based is by starting off with the phrase, students will be able to, or SWABAT for short. The second important criteria we'll talk about today is making sure that your objectives are measurable. This means that there has to be some way to determine if students have actually accomplished the objective. So we're gonna pause for another activity called Effective or Not. And what I'd like you to do is you're gonna take out a sheet of paper or open up a writing app on your device, 
and you're going to number the page from one to six. You're then going to read each of the objectives on this slide and write down whether each one is effective or not based on those two criteria that we just discussed. Once you're done with the activity, you can go ahead and resume this video. Welcome back. All right, so now we're gonna go over the six statements and discuss whether they are effective or not. All right, so number one says, students will be able to list the phases of the water cycle. So this objective is effective, right? So it's student achievement based and it's using a measurable verb, which is list. So I could easily see if students have accomplished this objective by having them write down the different phases of the water cycle or label an image. Number two says students will be able to understand the major parts of speech in a sentence. This objective is actually ineffective. So although it's student achievement based, it's using a really vague verb, which is understand. So how do we know that someone understands something? Is it just because they're nodding and smiling at us? Probably not a really good measurement of their knowledge. So we would actually want to use a more specific verb here. So maybe instead of understand, I could say students will be able to identify the major parts of speech in a sentence. And I could easily measure that by giving them you know, some different sentences and having them label or color code the different um, parts of speech that are there. Number three says the teacher will present a lesson on ordering fractions with different denominators. So this one is probably pretty obviously ineffective because it's focusing on the teacher. And remember, it's not about you. It's about what your students will know and be able to do by the end of the lesson. Number four says students will be able to appreciate various forms of poetry, including sonnets and lyric poetry. This one is also ineffective. So although it's student achievement based, let's look at that verb appreciate. Once again, how would you measure if someone could appreciate something? Is it because the students are in class and they're snapping along as they're listening to the poetry? Probably not. So while we definitely want students to appreciate things like that, we want to use a more measurable learning objective or learning goal here. So maybe instead of students will be able to appreciate various form forms of poetry, it's students will be able to describe various forms of poetry. All right, number five says students will be able to add fractions with like denominators. So this one is effective. It's student achievement based, and we could easily measure this by giving students some sample problems to solve. And then number six says students will be able to view scenes from the film version of The Crucible. So this objective is actually ineffective. So although it's student achievement based, look at what we're having them do. We're basically just saying they're watching a movie, which is not a learning objective, that is an activity. So once again, we want to focus on what students are going to know or be able to do as a result of this. So maybe they're going to be analyzing the themes or comparing and contrasting the characters. Those would be learning objectives. So as you can see, the verb plays a really significant role in whether or not your objectives are effective. So coming up, we're going to do a micro lecture on Bloom's taxonomy, which can be a really helpful framework for developing your objectives. And we're also going to talk about the process for deconstructing standards or taking standards and turning them into student achievement based and measurable objectives. So you can now hopefully define objectives, describe the characteristics of effective objectives and distinguish between effective and ineffective objectives. And to wrap, we're going to do an exit ticket. So what I'd like you to do is either scan the QR code that you see here on the slide, or you can visit the link, the bit.ly link that's listed below, which is bit.ly slash 3kh93zg. And it will take you to a Google form that you'll submit just to do a quick knowledge check and reflection on what you've learned today. So please take a few minutes to complete the exit ticket. And I look forward to seeing you in our next micro lecture. All right, so now that we have watched that video, let's go ahead and take some time to debrief it. And to do this, we're going to actually do a hashtag discussion using a thinking routine from Harvard's Project Zero, which is called See, Feel, Think, Wonder. So in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to share a response to at least one of these four prompts, See, Feel, Think, and Wonder, and you'll start your response with that hashtag. So hashtag see in your response, hashtag feel in your response, et cetera. So for C, it could be, what did you see or notice in the micro lecture? Feel, what feelings emerge for you as you watch the micro lecture? Think, what did this micro lecture make you think about? 
or wonder what questions kind of emerged for you. So take a moment and share your hashtag thought in the chat. Okay, and there's so many great responses coming in the chat right now. Heather said that she saw active learning strategies. Becky said that she felt connected to the professor and like I was part of the classroom. Awesome. Savannah echoes that same sentiment. Bonnie says, lots of ways I could use this in my class and redesigning for spring 2024. Awesome. Glad that this is helpful. Anna says she saw lots of examples. Michelle says, wonder how the um, instructor uses the exit strategy. Great question. So what I do there is... All of their responses come into a Google, Google form, and then I'm able to actually look at the spreadsheet responses so that I know if there's something that I need to revisit during the on-site class or maybe create another micro lecture to help address any gaps in understanding. Uh, Steven says, great accessibility. Melissa, she saw signals to use for key points and examples. Gloria, Gloria says she felt it was personal. Shava says, tremendous instructor presence. Okay, so many great thoughts here. Video placement around the screen. Okay, I'm gonna have to come back to the chat later because there's <laughs> so many great responses there. But hopefully, once again, this just shows one way of designing a micro lecture that, once again, is going to really engage our learners and also be, uh, you know, an amount of content that they can actually process within the time that we're giving them. So, thank you all for sharing those thoughts in the chat. Keep them coming. I'll definitely look at them afterwards. And with that, let's transition to our next element, which is the benefits of micro lectures. So I wanted to highlight some of the benefits of micro lectures, both for students and also for faculty. And Scagnoli has identified several important benefits on the student side of things. So first of all, because micro lectures are recorded, they really allow students to engage in self-paced learning. So they can rewind and fast forward and do whatever they need to do, watch as many times as necessary in order to really you know, internalize the content that they're watching. Along with that, micro lectures allow for on-the-go learning. So students can watch their watch them anytime, anywhere. Um, Christina Moore, I'm going to shout you out because she's in the room right now. <laughs> and she wrote a fantastic book about mobile mindful teaching and learning that talks specifically about this, how we can really help students leverage the devices that they have with them every day and learn from anywhere. And if micro lectures are, you know, short videos that they can squeeze into the time that they're waiting for the bus or, you know, on their way to, to work or to school, then we're really maximizing the time that students have available. Along with that, micro lectures allow for focused learning because once again, students can just zoom in to that particular concept or skill. We don't have to worry so much about the cognitive overload that they typically have with traditional instructional videos. And then they also talk about how micro lectures can enhance learning due to that incorporation of active learning techniques that prompt students to process the information. But they're not only helpful for students, they're also helpful for faculty. So first of all, they encourage us to be clear and concise in our instruction. So once again, weed out any unnecessary information so that students are getting what they actually need. They're also really versatile. So while we're talking about micro lectures within the con concept, within the context rather of like instructional videos, every time I do this workshop, I have faculty say, oh, I can actually use these principles in my on-site class. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so these principles are applicable regardless of the modality you're teaching in. And you can also use micro lectures in any modality. Along with that, micro lectures can inform instruction. So once again, if you have students watch it before they have an on-site class or they can actually submit their responses beforehand. And that way you can really tailor your instruction to what students need instead of regurgitating the information that they've already mastered. And then over time, your micro lectures can help you create reusable content. And we're actually gonna talk about some helpful principles to keep in mind so that you can keep your videos as evergreen as possible. And I see in the chat that others are sharing some other just additional benefits of micro lectures. So John says it limits the anxiety of doing a long video and getting something wrong. Yes, my, uh, John, I am a perfectionist. And even though I tell myself it doesn't have to be perfect, once I make a mistake, I feel that urge to like <laughs> redo it. And if that happens at the 15 or 20 or 30 minute mark, it's much harder than if it's, you know, 30 seconds into your video. So thank you for sharing that, John. And then... Stephen also mentions the durable content piece. It can be used in multiple places if needed. Yes. 
And then John also says it makes it easier to change the video later on if you want to update part of your curriculum. Yes. So instead of having to record the entire 60 minute video at once, you just, you know, replace that little piece. So thank you for sharing that. And then Julia says, I like the imperfections in your delivery. It makes you more human and relatable. Julia, thank you for calling that out. We're actually going to talk about the benefits of being imperfect a little bit later on. So while I am preaching to the choir and I'm still working against my own perfectionist tendencies, you are 100% correct that that is actually something that can help students connect with us even more. So thank you for sharing that in the chat. And I see you're getting a lot of love for that statement in there too. All right, so let's move on. And I wanted to just briefly talk about this piece about how micro lectures can be used in any modality. So yes, if you teach fully online, micro lectures are great for creating um, instructional videos and once again, manageable pieces. If you teach on site, you can create micro lectures that address concepts that students are struggling with, or maybe even to extend their learning beyond what you have time for during the class session. And then if you teach hybrid or flipped, once again, really great for teaching instructional content in small digestible bites. So they're great for pretty much every modality of instruction. All right, so let's move on and we're gonna talk about some different tools that you can use for creating micro lectures. And for this element, we're going to do a waterfall chat. So if you haven't done this before, the way it works is I'm going to put up a question on the slide in a moment, and then you're going to type your answer in the chat, but you're not going to press return or enter quite yet. So just let your response sit there. And then on the count of three, we'll all press return and all of the responses will come in at once. So the question I'd like you to type in the chat or respond to in the chat is which tools have you used to create instructional videos? So take about 15 seconds or so to type your answer in the chat, but you're not going to press return quite yet. All right, and on the count of three, we're all press return. One, two, three. <laughs> I'm not going to call out all of these because there's so many options, but yes, we have endless options for tools that we can use for creating instructional videos. And one thing that I like to tell faculty is, you know, pick one or two. I think sometimes we feel this pressure when it comes to ed tech to use everything that everyone else is using, which can be overwhelming. But I personally feel it's important to go deeper with a specific ed tech tool than to try to use everything. That said, it can be helpful to know what else is out there. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a few of my personal favorite tools for creating um, micro lectures. And then if any of these tools that I share resonate with you, you're more than welcome to also um, share that in the chat too. So one option for creating micro lectures is creating what's called a talking head video, where you just take the built-in camera on your phone or your tablet, like an iPad, and you press record and then you just talk to the screen similar to what you're seeing here on the screen. So the built-in camera app can be really great for creating quick micro lectures. Along with that, um, Flip, formerly known as Flipgrid, is another really great tool for creating uh, talking head videos. And talking head videos can be really helpful for creating that sense of instructor presence because you are right there front and center on the screen. Talking head videos are also great for any skills-based micro lectures where you may be demonstrating a specific course-related skill, and it would be helpful for students to see that in real time. Another option is that you can create a narrated slideshow using tools like Keynote and PowerPoint. And earlier I shared that that's what I did with um, the video you saw earlier, the sample micro lecture. I recorded that in Keynote. Keynote has a little built-in um, live video option where you can put yourself on the slide. It has a built-in annotation tool. So I just use screen recording on my iPad to record that. Um, PowerPoint also has similar tools that allow you to create narrated slideshows on your computer as well. And this is often a great entry point to creating um, instructional videos because these are tools that many professors are used to using every day. Along with that, you can create screencasts where you're actually capturing whatever is showing on your screen. And screencasts can either be audio only or can be audio along with video view, you know, in the corner of the screen too. And there are endless options for creating screencasts, things like QuickTime if you have an Apple device, Loom, which is my personal favorite screencasting tool. There's Screencastify, ScreenPal, which used to be called Screencast-O-Matic, Zoom, the screen recorder on the iPad. And a lot of you mentioned these tools earlier as helpful tools for creating instructional videos too. 
You can also create a digital whiteboard micro lecture. And this is another one that I did using my iPad. So I just opened up the notes app and I took my Apple pencil or you can use your finger as well. And this can be really great for actually drawing graphic organizers or diagrams or modeling how to solve a problem. And you can capture your audio along with whatever it is that you're drawing on the screen as another way to once again, mix up the types of instructional videos that you're creating for students. And then some other um, Apple specific apps I wanted to quickly highlight are Clips and iMovie. So Clips is an app that's available on all iPhones and iPads. iMovie is on all Apple devices, including MacBooks. And with these tools, you can create even more robust instructional videos that have special effects and captions and all sorts of things. So if you are interested in diving deeper into the video design piece, um, these can be two really great tools for doing that. And then lastly, for this part, I wanted to highlight some interactive video tools that are freemium. These are ed tech tools that you can utilize. So PlayPosit and Edpuzzle. And the benefit of these tools is that you can take an existing video, whether it's one that you find on YouTube or one that you've created yourself, you upload it to the platform, and then you can actually embed questions throughout the video so that when students are watching the video back and it gets to a question, they have to answer that question before they can continue watching the video. So platforms like this are really great because it kind of builds in that active learning by default. You don't have to tell students, pause the video and do X, Y, and Z because the video will naturally pause until students respond to the question. And once again, these are freemium, so you can <laughs> use them for free with some limitations. And then if you're interested in, in paying for um, higher end versions, you can do that too. All righty, so now that we've talked about different tools that you can use for creating micro lectures, um, feel free to share in the chat if there's something new that you either saw in the chat or something that I shared that you might be interested in exploring further. Feel free to do that. And I'm going to call out Savannah's comment. She says, I love how you're showing that we don't need all these fancy, expensive tools. There are so many free tools that are re readily available on our, our devices. Yes. <laughs> so maximize what you've got. And then if you have energy and bandwidth, you can always expand from there. All righty. I'm seeing people that are interested in exploring Flip, iMovie, Keynote, Edpuzzle, PlayPosit. Lauren said, it's hard to not get distracted by other tools. I 100% agree with you. And especially because I love EdTech, I'm just like, ooh, <laughs> let me try this, let me try that. And I have to like, just kind of check myself and be like, not now, maybe that's a future thing I'm gonna explore. All right, thank you all for sharing that in the chat. And let's move on to planning. And I saw in the um, questions that people submitted prior to this workshop that a lot of people are interested in like, how can I actually support faculty in planning their micro lectures well? So I wanna provide a brief overview of the five-step process that I typically recommend to faculty. And this begins with planning the micro lecture and then creating whatever materials you might need or gathering any materials that you might need, recording it, captioning it, and sharing it. And I'm gonna focus for this next part of our session on the planning phase. So I have created a planning template that I share with faculty to help them kind of think through what they're going to be doing in their micro lectures. I'm gonna give a high level overview of it now. And then in a moment, I'll be sharing the link to it. And then uh, you'll be able to share any thoughts you have about it as well. So the way the template is designed is there's a pre-planning section. And this is where faculty identify the specific course, topic, learning objectives, and assessment that they're going to use in their micro lecture. And then the second part of the template is where um, faculty outline what they're going to do in the beginning, middle, and end of the micro lecture. And for this part of the template, I encourage faculty to think about the content, in other words, what they're going to say or do, and then the interaction, what students are going to actually do to process that information. And you'll notice on the template that there are interaction points for each part of the micro lecture, but I always stress that there are no hard and fast rules about how many interactions you need. So really think about your content, your context, your students, what you know, you are the expert in your field, and you can include as many interactions as feel appropriate based on the content of your video. So maybe that's just one meaningful interaction at the beginning or one meaningful interaction at the end. It's completely up to you. And then the final part of the template is where faculty identify next steps. So what is going to be the format for their micro lecture? And then what materials will they need to create or gather in order to make it a reality? So I'm gonna share the link to a Padlet board in the chat. 
you can go ahead and click on that link there. And when you get to the Padlet, you'll see that there is a column for micro lecture planning template. And I've included two different ways of accessing the template. So if you have a Google account, you're going to follow the directions in the first blue post in order to be able to access the template. If you do not have a Google account, you can scroll down to the second yellow post. And once again, you'll see the directions for um, accessing the template. So I'm gonna pause and give everyone a moment to access the template, whichever way works best for you. And then please give me a Zoom reaction or let me know in the chat once you have it open and ready to go. All right, and I'm seeing readies and some thumbs up. Wonderful. So here's what we're going to do. I'm gonna give you a few minutes just to explore the template. So feel free to read what's there, click around, you know, just once again, take it all in. And then as you are exploring the template, I'd like you to share your thoughts about it on the Padlet board. So there are three columns here for I like, I wish, I wonder. And you can simply click on the plus sign below a specific column to add your thoughts to it. And if it's your first time using Padlet, um, I've included a welcome column that also includes information about how to post there. So I'm gonna give you about probably more like five minutes or so to explore the template. And then we will debrief that afterwards too. So hopefully that gave you a chance to explore the document, click around. Um, I was monitoring the Padlet board on my other device, and I can see that there are tons of responses there. Um, so what I'm going to do is after this session, I will return to the Padlet, and I'm going to respond to as many things as I can there. Um, and if there are any like burning questions that you have, please feel free to place them in the Q&A area um, so I can address them during this, this live session. Um, I also wanted to call out that if there are aspects of this template that are working well for you and you're like, yes, this would be great to use with my faculty, but other parts where you're like, mm, I don't know, maybe I want to give them fewer options or replace it with something else, please feel free to adapt this template based on your personal needs and your own context. So this is not something that has to be followed to a T. Um, I want it to work for you. And I tell faculty the same thing when I give them the template. I'm just like, do whatever you wish with this. <laughs> because some are going to want a lot of ideas and others are going to be like, okay, I just want to start with one or two things and we can build, a, build from there. So please feel free to make it work for you. All right. So with that, let's return to our overall plan. Once again, we start by planning our micro lecture and then we create the micro lecture, record it, caption it, and share it. And I wanted to share some helpful principles for the remaining four steps of creating, recording, captioning, and sharing. All right, so let's go to our recording tips. And I wanted to give a shout out to Professor Michael Wesch, who is very well known for his incredible instructional videos. And he recorded a video called um, Make Super Simple Videos for Teaching Online, in which he shares a lot of helpful tips that he abides by when he's making his videos. So I just wanted to highlight four of these. Um, first of all, he talks about the importance of having good lighting. So we don't wanna be backlit when we're creating our instructional videos. Once again, once again, that can create a sense of disconnect because students can't see you really well. So ideally having natural light or um, you know, another source of light that's facing you from the front so that you're well lit. Along with that, you wanna make sure that your audio is clear. So I know some people will use an external microphone when they're recording their videos, or if you can't do that, just making sure you're in a really quiet space when you're recording. You wanna have a stable recording setup as well. So if you're using your laptop, making sure it's on a table or something that's not gonna move around too easily. If you're recording on your phone or tablet, ideally having a tripod that's gonna hold it so that once again, things aren't moving around. And then, and I don't remember who mentioned it earlier. I think it might've been Julia, 
embracing mistakes. So not feeling like your video has to be absolutely per perfect. And I wanted to share this quote from Flower Darby from her book, Small Teaching Online, where she also talks about the value of imperfection. So she said, students prefer informal videos in which you are authentic to stiff, formal, or professionally edited videos. They want to see and hear you being you. You needn't record and re-record until you achieve the perfectly polished presentation. Do you always articulate every word perfectly when teaching in the classroom? If not, don't worry about doing so in your videos. And if that doesn't convince you, I'm going to share another quote <laughs> uh, from Michelle Pekansky Brock, Michael Schmetz Jammer, and Kim Vincent Layton. And they said that when professors portray their imperfections, the ums, quizzical expressions, background interruptions like a cat jumping on the desk or a child peeping in the background, and move away from their desk to record in their daily settings, they become real and relatable. In other words, they become humanized. Students begin to sense that their online instructor is a real person with imperfections and a busy life much like them. So imperfections are actually a good thing. And I highly recommend checking out a book that Karen Costa wrote, and I saw someone mention this in the chat as well. It's a book called 99 Tips for Creating Simple and Sustainable Educational Videos. And she offers a lot of practical advice for creating really strong videos. So I just want to highlight three of the tips from, from her book. One of them is uh, tip 36, forget Hollywood. And this is the idea that your instructional videos don't have to be these high quality productions with all the be bells and whistles. Simple is perfectly fine. Tip 62 is the camera will eat your energy. And here Karen encourages you to be a little bit more animated and dynamic than maybe you would normally be because when you're recording a video, the camera magically has a way of sapping some of that energy. So being a little bit more, um, yeah, enthusiastic can come across just right when you're actually recording the video. And then tip 63 is keep a general. And this is really, really important if you wanna be able to reuse your videos in the future. So Karen recommends that you avoid mentioning any specific deadlines or due dates, holidays, anything that's specific to a time of year or term, because once you mention that in your video, it kind of timestamps it. So instead of including those details in your video, place them somewhere else, like in your LMS, so that once again, you can reuse that video as often as needed in the future. All right, and as we wrap, I wanna talk briefly about the importance of accessibility and thinking about how you wanna share your videos with students. And my question for you all is, which students benefit from captions? So please feel free to share your thoughts in the chat. <laughs> And yes, that is a trick question because the answer is all of them. Um, and there's a really awesome graph here from 3Play Media where they highlight all the different ways and all the different reasons rather students use captions. And it's to help them focus, watch videos in noisy or quiet environments. Um, some use it to be able to understand the language. So as Stephen mentioned, students that are multilingual learners, they need those captions as well. So we always want to make sure that any instructional videos we create have accurate captions with them. Now, there are a few different ways to go about captioning. Um, some of the tools that I've personally used are Clips. Clips has a feature called Live Titles, where as you're recording, the captions will appear on the screen, and then you can go in and actually edit all of the captions for accuracy. I also know of a lot of professors that will upload their videos to YouTube, um, but sometimes they'll stop with just uploading it to YouTube and not actually going in to check the captions. So I just want to emphasize here that if you're using any sort of auto-generated captions, it's really important to go back, watch the vi video from beginning to end, and make any edits to the spelling, grammar, capitalization, content, et cetera, so that the information students are getting from the captions is just as accurate as the information they would be getting if they were listening to the video live. And one other tool I wanted to um, highlight here is Loom, because Loom not only has captions, but it also has transcripts. Once again, great for that universal design principle of providing multiple, mean, multiple means of representation. So in Loom, whenever you record an instructional video, it will produce a transcript and you can go in and edit the transcript. And then the edited transcript will also be reflected in the captions. So that way the captions are accurate. You can download the um, transcripts and upload that to your LMS as another resource for students. So yes, Lauren, this can be edited and this is all free under the free plan too. And then lastly, we want to think about how we're going to share our videos with students. So you can embed them in your LMS. You can make a YouTube playlist. Um, or Christina Moore talks in the, her book as well about the importance of 
including the time, the length of time that the video is in the name of the video. So that way students can plan accordingly in terms of whether they can watch the video now or maybe they wanna wait a little bit later on. All right, so we have gone through a lot of content today about micro lectures. I wanna start wrapping us up so I can honor your time today. And you can now hopefully describe the characteristics and benefits of micro lectures, identify different tools that can be used to create micro lectures, and describe important factors to consider when recording and sharing micro lectures. And I wanna leave you with this encouragement from Flower Darby who says, start with one mini lecture video. Is there a concept that has always been hard to convey in your online class? There's a subject of your first mini lecture video. The next time you teach that class, add a couple more. So as Karen Casa always says in her workshops, start small. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to provide some resources related to this workshop. Um, you can click on the link that I've just shared in the chat. Oops, wrong link. Let me give you the right one. Here it is. Workshop resources. I have created a web page full of resources related to this topic. So you can access my slides, um, some articles I've written about micro lectures, the sample video I shared is linked here, the template is linked here, the Padlet activity. And then I've also created a wakelet, which is full of additional articles and resources related to micro lectures. So you can do a deep dive into this topic and pick and choose whatever would work best for you and your faculty. And then along with that, I would love to stay in touch with you all after the sessions. So you can find me on pretty much all the social media things. Um, and I've also pasted that information in the chat. And last but not least, I welcome any feedback you have about this session. So you can click on the link in the chat or scan the QR code, which will take you to a brief feedback form. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. I know it's that time of the year where we all have a lot on our plates. So thank you for carving out some time to come and talk about this topic. I will hang out here for a few more minutes in case there are any questions, but if not, just wanna say thank you and have an amazing day. Mm -hmm.